question is answered. That uh, interesting hand for my tournament last time when I did Shaky Lackey's question answered too. So. Yep. Yep. All I'm good. glad you said that Oops. Chev was was you would lean towards Chev because Steve was really beating himself up about that last night. And, no. and I was it telling was him I was, that question. it was a Chev. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, especially. Um, I mean. It's just in general when you have a bigger stack than somebody else and you're at a final table. I mean, you sh you're you more incentivized to be jamming because they're less incentivized to be calling off for their tournament life. So you're just going to be making more money in that spot than you would in normal chip EV scenarios. So and um, I just think, yeah, it's absolutely a, a shove. I mean, again, we can run it through ICMizer. I'm sure it's going to tell us it's a shove as well. I'm just kind of more curious uh, what the other stacks were because I think that's definitely going to determine how valuable that shove actually is. And at the same time, I also want to see like how big of a percentage of our range we actually get to shove profitably in that spot. So yeah, we can look at that later. Sounds good. All right, let's get this into it, guys. Farm. There's like two crushers in the chip league here. Love this. Has anybody seen this yet for what it's worth? I have not, but, you know, recognize some of the names, obviously. They are smack, dude. Oh, just to let you guys know, this guy, you win, take it, is like a high stakes crusher. I think he plays like a really strange strategy, but I've seen him like putting up some pretty godly um, uh, numbers when it comes to uh, how many big blinds per 100 hands he's winning, so... Oh, wow. I think the only recreational here really is Neymar, so it'll be fun to see this. Is it that chip stack they get like 350k or something? Yeah, well, the, the, that, that, was, that was their total earnings in their career. Oh, that wasn't how big wow. they are. So, okay, so oh, for those of you seeing right now the numbers, uh, besides the BB, that's how many big blinds that they have. So Neymar's actually the chip leader here right now with 150 big blinds. Let's go, Nate. Yeah, Neymar's sick. Like, what's going on here? <laughs> He's in uh, for he two bullets. Too rich so. to care, that's for sure. Yeah. He never yeah. rich the bluffed one. He never bluffed the rich one. Yeah. Yeah. I'm probably gonna see a fold here, and I'd expect the small blind to have a pretty high frequency limp strategy. Wizzo, Wizzo, obviously a very strong reg. I remember that with a 1k I won in 2012 at W crew and I remember a really big bluff I pulled off on Wizzo Wizzo where I like check called a flop and like let it turn with like king high and he folded and it was on like a fucking it was on the replay and shit I just remember it really well for some reason like certain bluffs you just remember it probably wasn't even a good bluff you know but we just went for it so this is an interesting spot here um oh, yeah Wait, what, did, was it check the whole lane and he bet the no check check on the flop it was bad on the turn bad on the turn and then he check calls the turn and now he is dunk leading the river here, which might be a thing. Um, Does he have the king of hearts here? Yeah, it's because he has the king of hearts. Y yeah, for sure. I'm, ju I'm just more so questioning whether or not he gets lead in the spot. I think when these flushes hit the river, uh, I think it's kind of okay because he really just puts a lot of pressure on, like, every... every uh, Every hand that you win take it has that's not a four because obviously a four is just going to snap, but the rest of their range uh, might have a difficult time calling. Um, I also think if he was going to bet there, he should probably choose a larger size. I don't think that he's even going to get two pair to fold that much in that spot. Can so. back a second? Can we go back a second? I just want to see if this king queen. Yeah, it was kind of bad. No, I, well, that, oh yeah, just, we'll go back this to this spot. Yeah. Just the next hand, too. I was like, what? Can we just fold the king queen in an interesting spot? So, yeah. Kurt, you're... You're saying that that pot is is too small to bet in this situation. Like he should be going like one point five x two x pot. So what he's doing so, here is he's representing. Oh, what's up? Yeah. No, no, go ahead. Okay, so what he's trying to do here is he's trying to represent a flush. That means he has a very polarized range here. He's at a four x disadvantage. So I don't think he's really trying to rep a four here. Obviously, with the king of hearts, he's trying to rep a flush. So he's trying to rep a polarized range. And, um, I mean, too bad this video isn't coming out yet. I have a like really good example in the video I sent you yesterday, Max. But essentially when we get in a spot where we're only representing the very top of our range, we want to use very polarized sizes. That ensures that we put on maximum pressure uh, when we have a bluff like we have right here. Let's say if uh, you wouldn't take it, uh, like let's say he delayed uh, C-bet a hand like A7 that he just checked back. Um, or even even like five deuce 
he could have here. He could bet on the turn. And then if we just make it like 300k here on the river and you have five deuce, like how happy are you in this spot? So essentially what happens when you, again, when you want to represent a very polarized uh, range here, which is just going to be like flushes and bluffs, you can use very, very, very big sizes here. And that's usually the sizes we want to use here. So although I think the size is probably fine. And um, another thing I want to say is that we're a little less incentivized to use these massive sizes when there's an ICM component because each chip that we have is worth so much. But obviously what he's trying to do here is he's trying to rep flushes or bluffs here. So one, I want to know if he does have leads here. And I'm going to say probably he does. Uh, but then again, if he does, I would prefer him to make it uh, a bigger size where he's really putting a lot of pressure on let's say you win take it's like two pair and lesser type of hands obviously like i said he has a hand that he's not going to fold for any size he blocks flushes and he has a straight so he should not be folding this specific can for any size but for any other like value range that you win take it uh might have here you're putting a lot more pressure on him by making it a larger size. And then on the flip side, when he does decide to hero you and you actually have a hand like King Jack of Hearts, you're uh, you're getting paid uh, you know a larger amount than you would be getting paid if you just bought uh, bet like three quarters to pot here, basically. So you maximize the amount of money you're going to win when you have it and you put on max pressure uh, when you're bluffing here, essentially. So yeah, you're gonna get him to fold a lot of good like let's say a two X, five X, three X, they could have all those cards where he doesn't hit the river. Yeah, like I said, even two pair is going to be in a really tough spot. Like, if he makes a 400k here on the river, and you have five deuce here, are you happy to be calling here? Like, does five deuce call every single time? Uh, really, like, honestly, a hand like, like let's say, a seven with a heart would be a better call than five deuce because Wizzo is repping flushes, so you're less incentivized to call without a heart and more incentivized to call with a heart because then obviously it's it's less likely that Wizzo is going to have a flush here. So this is when you get to the point where you don't look at your actual hand strength uh, as a deciding factor of whether or not you want to call, but what hands block the uh, the hands that Wizzo is trying to represent here. So any any pair with a heart would be a better call and you wouldn't take it spot than like a two pair or trips kind of hand. You know what I mean? Yeah, glad we went back to that, actually. That that probably uh, deserved more discussion. So wh where was the king-queen that you said we breezed it through? It was on the button. Uh, you wouldn't take it. That's king-queen on the button. It looks like he just folds. I guess because the king's lead is opening. But it, no, he's got queen five. Queen. No, 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 you'll see his next hand. Next okay. Hand on the button. So the chip lead opens the queen ten suit. Or not chip lead. Second in chips opens here. And he folds. Looks like he folds king-queen on the button here. Um. Yeah, it's probably a bit tight. Um. I mean, I don't hate it. But him being on the button, yeah, I don't know. I honestly know. And again, I think he's more so uh, a cash game rake. So his um, his preflop strategy uh, might not be as strong as some of these other uh, tournament regulars. So, and again, I don't hate the fold, but I think it's probably a little too strong uh, to fold. I think he can, he can probably like three bet or call mostly there. Uh, so we see an interesting bet here from Neymar. Very interesting river. Uh, no tilt now has trips. Anjay has the boat. Probably like Neymar's bet a lot better if he has the nine diamonds. So, so I don't I don't necessarily hate a bet there. This is actually something that I want to talk to you guys about as well. Um, and something that I see from a lot of uh, mediocre players is that when they have a hand like Neymar has, they just want to kind of bet here for a quote unquote protection. But you also have to realize that if you're betting every type of hand like this, that when you check, uh, you're not really going to have many hands that can end up check calling versus a bet. Because if you just bet everything that has a little bit of value slash equity here, then when you check, your range is just going to be so weak and there's nothing you can really uh, defend with. So I don't really love this bet by Neymar. I think uh, his hand's still pretty strong. Uh, he can easily check call any bet here on the turn. And also he disguises the strength of his hand here. So I think it's like a little too weak to bet for value, but definitely too strong to be folding to a bet. And without a diamond blocker for a little bit of backup in case he is in like really tough, uh, 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 sticky spot here versus somebody else's range, I would definitely prefer to be um, checking uh, the majority of the time with a hand like this. And again, this is something that you see from uh, a lot of mediocre to weaker players is uh, essentially whenever they have any kind of piece of the board, 
uh, they just want to bet to kind of you know push their equity and you know uh, protect their their value rather than um, ever you know, putting these hands into their checking range and, and ensuring that whenever they check, they do have some strong hands that can call, or at least mediocre hands like Neymar's. It's not a strong hand, but it's definitely good enough to call the one bet and then reevaluate going to the river. So, And then I think everybody just folded on the river. What's up? <laughs> uh, oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, Tell all he's uh, he's still winning. He's still doing it. I mean, I don't know how much he's winning. I know he plays a lot of these big games. I've definitely seen him uh, with some good caches in these replays here. But uh, yeah, I also don't know how like GTO sound he is. So, but I mean, he seems. I've seen him play. He's not like a, a a whale by any means. Like he plays well enough. So I'm assuming we're gonna see Wizzo uh, give up here. Uh, wow, this is this is very loose to not have a heart here um i mean i guess it's kind of good his blockers aren't great like his ace blocker doesn't really block a hand like ace king because you wouldn't take it is never going to have a hand like that um what happened here on the river okay yeah, he just the made the flush here so yeah I, so so in general i think wizzle's flop bet is probably not the greatest i mean the board is relatively dry um, I don't hate the fact that he's betting here because he should have a really uh, tight preflop opening range here. So um, when that happens, he's usually going to be able to see bet at a pretty uh, aggressive frequency. But at the same time, we don't want to be see betting as aggressively at final tables as we would in the early to mid stages of a tournament because um, we have less incentive to be putting in money so wide when every chip is worth so much money in these final tables. So um, I can kind of get behind the bet on the flop. I think the bet on the turn is a massive spew. Um, he's never going to get any kind of flush draw to fold. He doesn't block flush draws either, uh, which is kind of a problem for him. Uh, he only really blocks king-queen, uh, and we don't even know if you win take it. Ends up calling here with a hand like king-queen offsuit because he doesn't block the king-queen suited here. Um, so, yeah, I, I can kind of get behind the bet on the flop. I think the bet on the turn is, uh, is pretty poor. And then on the river, it's, it's a clear give up, of course. Yeah, yeah, legend. Maybe you, maybe you said that I missed that moment, but I, I played so much that account raid a lot. Yeah, he's, he's still doing it. I remember when I played the 2K heads up way back in the day. He made, like, the sickest just call with the second nut flush against me, and I was so tilted because <laughs> I had two nut flush. I was just like, how did you do that? Mm -hmm. Got to see a jam here, more than likely. Neymar just going to YOLO it. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> 25 days, whatever. Yeah. Who cares? Gonna see a jam here. I uh, wouldn't be surprised to see a call. Yeah, I was just gonna say uh, this would definitely be a call for Chip EV. He's a smaller stack. Uh, uh, P Vigor is definitely gonna be jamming worse than King Ten, so pretty standard spot there. Expect to see an open so here. Let's see, if we can get to, let's see if we can get to some spots where we could like ask people's opinion on what they were doing before with like certain weird hands. Let's say like I think the Tor Four would have been a good one. I'm um, interested that he didn't shove this four four. It's kind of oh no, sorry. Yeah, I thought he had five hundred k. Excuse me. He definitely shouldn't be shoved. Yeah, I do like getting the. Feet. I was like, yeah. damn, Steve. <laughs> yeah, like you're worried about the nine six suited for thirteen bigs, but you just want to rip it in here with fours. <laughs> for a hundred and thirty bigs. <laughs> no. Thought Neymar was yeah. yellowing. I will probably see you and take it. Uh, wow, that's, um, I mean, it's not terrible uh, to see a fold here. Uh, honestly, between uh, P Vigor, Wizzo, and No Till, uh, you and take it is going to be pretty disincentivized to be playing pots against Neymar. Uh, even though, like, you and take it is a crusher, the fact that Neymar has him covered and he's playing the pot out of position just tells a whole lot here. Um, I think just seeing this fold it, it should kind of let you guys know how. Uh, little incentivized we are to actually be playing pots against uh, bigger stacks uh, in these final table situations because you and take it is really uh, incentivized to kind of just wait things out and uh, wait for the shorter stacks to bust before he starts kind of battling with these other big stacks. Well, like, what would you, I guess if you were in you and take it shoes other than folding, what would the other options would calling be? Probably the only other option there. Um, I guess be on the table still, or I guess the stacks aren't great for that. But I think both are on the table, but 
he probably wants to be a little bit more polarized with his, with his three betting range. And I think ace eight suit is probably a little too strong in this situation to be uh, three bet folding. Uh, he also doesn't really, he's disincentivized to be bloating pots out of position against Neymar. Uh, so I also don't know how Neymar plays. Like if he's like really sticky, he's even less incentivized to be three betting wide in a spot like that. So I guess I would lean more towards call than anything. Uh, we're going to see a jam here with the eights. Almost feels like a normal Brazilian if Neymar plays the real question. So. <laughs> Has he been learning that from like, good play, it doesn't doesn't seem like it. The which same. Brazilians, I mean, which Brazilians has he been learning from, you know? The siding seemed okay in, like, a few of the spots. He's been maybe that one night. It eight, seems but... decent pre-flop, at least, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I but, mean, I mean, in all fairness, it's a very, pre-flop is very <laughs> um, kind of cut and dry, I would say. I'm sure he's talking with enough decent regulars here to uh, know the proper, you know, opening sizes here. I would here. hope so if he's blasting 10Ks online. Right. So what do you think of this flat here in the small line? I Fan of it, but this this is Vogel saying here for what it's worth. I mean, he's been crushing for a long time. Um, mm -hmm. It's I don't hate it. Um, obviously, Wizzo should be very tight here from EP, uh, especially with P Vigar um, at twelve bigs here. So uh, it's a bit on the loose side, but I really don't hate it uh, whatsoever. Can you call from a small blind. Yeah, yeah. Probably, not something I'm, probably something I'm not doing enough at like this big stack. Against short stack stack step, I feel like flat in the small blind here with an eight seven suited. Like I feel like I probably would start with like is that suited. is that profitable? That seems Chippy V, absolutely, yeah. For Chippy V, it's absolutely a call here. Um, now my question is, at a final table, do we end up calling it here? Well, and yeah, I would probably, yeah, yeah. and especially because Wizzo is opening such a tight range, um, that hand is going to be making less money than it would be. But, um. Yeah, it, it's it's kind of it's borderline. You know what I'm saying? I'm not gonna say it's bad by any means. I would absolutely, you know, I'm not surprised to see him flick it in there, uh, but I wouldn't be surprised to see him fold. And I would kind of understand why because of how tight Wizzo's range is gonna be from under the gun. But yeah, for just for just for Chip EV, it it would absolutely be a V pip there. Okay. Arm too tight. <laughs> yeah, that's yeah, what. Me too. <laughs> <laughs> A lot of those suited asexes make it into the uh, either call or three bet range, uh, in those yeah, positions. Yeah, more towards three betting. Like if I was going to. So at twenty play. big blinds, you probably don't have a lot of like three bet folds. So you're either yeah, like three bet jamming, and I think the hand's like a little too weak to be jamming, but too strong to be folding. So I think that's why you see a lot of high frequency call, and then you probably yeah. like for your like three bet bluff range, you probably get to jam like some ace five, ace four suited, and then be calling more with like your ace seven, ace eight, ace nine suiteds. Yeah, that makes sense. Mm -hmm. uh, would be a surprise to see a lead here on this turn. He did snap check, and now we should see a pure bluff here. Um, yeah, uh, so well played, all in all. Uh, and this is another thing I, I want to talk about here. So obviously a, a good board for uh, you and take its range here. Uh, the two broadways are always going to be better for the opener's range here from an earlier position than from the big blind. Um, and the check call is fine here, obviously. Uh, and so why I say I wouldn't be surprised to see a lead here? Because we did say you win, take it, bet uh, half pot here on the flop, which is a bit on the big side. I mean, it's fine. The bet size itself is fine. But it's getting to the point where it's uh, becoming a more polarized size. So the smaller we bet, the wider of a range that we can have. But when he starts betting like for bigger sizes, he's basically polarizing his range to like strong king x and really strong draws and he's not going to have like the eight seven suiteds in his range where he's betting that size for because it doesn't really make a whole lot of sense to be betting that big uh with that type of hand because you're not getting you know many worse hands to fold out in that spot so essentially he's saying like he has a strong draw or a strong king here and he's not gonna have a lot of 8x in this range so when uh Watt and Lose ends up check calling here uh, he should have more 8x in his range than you and take it. Now, I wouldn't expect him to pure donk lead here on the turn, but I definitely think it would be an option. I also think Wantmos is going to have more 8x in his big blind defending range than you and take it's going to have in their opening range. So, um, although it's probably not a pure uh, donk lead, I definitely think it would get in, in in this situation. And then once it gets to the river here, uh, a lot of times clubs are not the greatest cards to be bluffing with. 
but a lot of these lower flushes uh or flush draws are a lot better because i guess they do unblock like let's say you wouldn't take it as a hand like you know ace, ace five of clubs something like that he, he gets uh those better flush draws uh to fold when he ends up bluffing here uh, then at the same time, I mean, he has 9 high. There's not a whole lot he can do. He's still going to have king x when he check calls here. He's going to have 8x, as I said. Um, but then he's also going to have, like, a lot of missed draws. Like, every straight draw, every flush draw bricks here. So I would expect Watmos to mainly be using uh, sizes that are, like, two-thirds and bigger. Uh, again, clubs aren't the greatest combos to be bluffing here, but they absolutely need to be bluffed at some frequency. So if I'm in Watmos' shoes, I'm probably choosing to... Uh, like bluff around two thirds to three quarters pot size with uh, a hand like he has right now. And then let's say we have a hand like 10 nine of spades that we check call the flop with. I would probably choose an overbet uh, like like a 1.2x, 1.5x overbet size here to really kind of polarize uh, our range here. We also unblock a lot of flushes that he's going to auto fold. Uh, we put him in a tricky spot if he has a hand like ace jack or maybe he has like ace four clubs. It's just, just like his hero calling range basically. And uh, then we're also going to want to go like pretty polar here with uh, an eight as well because it's very unlikely that you wouldn't take it as, um, you know, anything stronger than trip eights here. So this is kind of a spot where every draw bricks, but we can also rep like a really strong range here too. So another situation where we probably want to lean towards uh, betting a more polarized size here. So yeah, with this exact combo he has with the clubs, I like his size. He bet about three quarters on the river. I think we absolutely have to bluff in that spot. So uh, well played all around. Oh, and the other point I wanted to make is that we do see you win take it. Check back here with his king. I think a lot of people are just going to automatically uh, end up betting the turn here with their king because you know there's straight draws out there. There's flush draws out there. He wants to bet for protection. But if you're just piling in money with this strength of a king all the time, uh, then when you check, you're not going to have like easy like calls w once you get to the like this sort of river because you're just not going to have any king x in your range. So all of your uh, all of your uh, range on the river is basically just going to be some sort of hero call. So this allows you and take it to have some uh, like easy calls once it comes to the river. And he also makes it harder for Wanton Lowe's to bluff because he still has strong hands in his range once he checks here. So I like to check on the turn here a lot generally for pot control you would say for pot control and again the eight's not great for him so it's a little easier but even if the turns like for example like the seven of spades here i would still expect this this hand to check i mean it would be he'd be a little bit more incentivized to bet here i guess because he doesn't have to be as worried about trips uh, as you know now that the eight of spades comes on the turn but in general when you do have these top pairs and you bet them on the flop, they're usually decent candidates for checkbacks on the turn just to keep, like I said, to keep some top pair in your range here so that when you check on the turn, you're not just having like flush draws or, or jack X or ace queen or ace 10. You want to have some strong top pairs where once it does go check check and your opponent ends up betting on the river, you just have a very easy call. And uh, that way you're going to be a lot harder to bluff and, um, you know, your opponent's going to, you know, think twice the next time they bluff because they know you're capable of checking back some strong hands here on the turn. bit of a loose open here from Anjay, especially when he's opening into uh, Neymar's button and Vogelsang's big blind. This is actually like way too loose, I would say. Specifically because of the button in the big blind here, he should be very disincentivized to be playing pots in this position. Expect to see Vogelsang to bluff this river. Yeah, and he's got a snap call here now. I don't really know what he's waiting on here. I mean, you have to call there. Like, if you're going to open a hand like a queen there, like you just have to call on the river. I think I think flop went check, check, right? It looks like it. It's kind of quick mm -hmm. there, but... Okay, so this is actually um, a decent spot to talk about here on the flop. Um, this board is super dry. So, again, if we're playing for pure chip EV, I think we can just be very aggressive with our strategy here on the flop and bet very aggressively for a small size here. But um, once again, when ICM dynamics are at play here, and especially when Vogelsang has Anjay covered, he's going to be less incentivized to just put in money, not only with like, you know, bluffs, but also like mediocre value 
and you know he has essentially the worst queen he's going to have here so i think this makes a decent check candidate here and Vogelsang is a pretty easy uh turn bet i would say uh, he can kind of do whatever. I, I think he can bet small. He can bet big here. He could also potentially overbet, especially since he does block, like, really strong, you know, queens that may have checked back here. And he also blocks, you know, the ace-5, the 5-6. And then his hand's worth basically nothing here on the river. So I'm okay with him if you're bluffing here. But the fact that Andre's like, tanking here, I just, I don't understand. He blocks, like, you know, the strongest hands Vogelsang's going to have. I also don't think Vogelsang is betting just, like, a 4 on the turn here. Unless he's essentially, like, merge betting a hand like 6-4, 5-4, which I don't think he's always doing for the bigger size. I think he would probably block on the turn more often than not with hands like that. Uh, so once his 4 comes on the river, I'm not too worried about it. Like, if he has a hand like 4 dues, 4-3, you know, he's behind anyway, so the 4 is kind of irrelevant. And, uh, yeah, he just has to call here on the river. So I'm not quite sure what the delay was all about. I know he's not thinking about raising, so... Uh, yeah, interesting spot here. I, I also really hate the open there in the first place, too. Aggressive open. Very aggressive open. Unnecessary. I like the check back on the flop. You know, yeah. Uh, before, I, I got to roll out, but I, I appreciate um, listening to all this. It's just very easy hearing Kurt and the talk poker. All right, cool. Yeah, we do these uh, Tuesdays and Thursdays, guys. So if you want to uh, come join us for the next one, uh, absolutely. Uh, great to have all these numbers in here. So, um, yeah, glad you guys got to get in here for a little bit. I came in late. Is that the real Neymar? That is That's the, the real, real Neymar. Neymar. That's what I thought. Uh, yeah, we, I, know we, I, know, I know he's a big player, but he's making final tables versus all these guys, huh? Yeah, we had a request from the uh, community to check out uh, this final table, basically because they wanted to see how a guy like Neymar would play against the strongest regulars in the world, and he just starts a table with a massive chip lead. So I guess he's kind of holding his own against all these crushers, so that's pretty cool to see. And from what I've seen it. so far, he's playing well. I love it. Mm -hmm. Oh, I love to see it. Mm. Love to see it. Yeah. All right, so uh, aggressive uh, C-bet here. I think a little on the big side, but it's probably fine. Um, the board's going to be pretty good for Neymar's range there, so I don't mind seeing a bet there. Uh, pretty bad open here by the pocket twos. Uh, a little too aggressive uh, in this spot for sure. I haven't seen Neymar do anything Brazilian yet. No, no, not at all. I'm a little disappointed. <laughs> But expect to see an open from Vogel saying here. Uh, open 2014 here, you know. I mean, actually, Kurt would know better than me. He plays with them every day. So this is going to be interesting. Actually, unfortunately, we're not going to see what happens here. But um, I was just kind of curious to see what you wouldn't take it would do had this folded to him after Vogel saying's open with the Ace King here. Um, I would not have been surprised to see a flat uh, because again, uh, you wouldn't take it is going to be pretty disincentivized to be putting in uh, a lot of money with another deep stack. Uh, although he has a very strong hand here, uh, P. Vigar is almost out of the tournament. Wizzo's super short. And then uh, No Tilt and Watt, most also, you know, relatively short as well. So just in general, the way stacks are set up, I would not be surprised to see if you wouldn't take it, uh, would have just ended up calling versus Vogelsang's open here. Uh, and again, that really falls back to the table dynamic and how many short stacks there are and just how disincentivize you and take it is to be putting in a lot of money here um, out of position even though ace king's a very strong hand unfortunately we're not gonna get to see that result Ooh, wizzo being wizzo isn't uh isn't ace king kind of forced to call the flop though uh on the c-bet like in on every single board texture though if he does flat um like i can see why a three bet makes sense there because you're kind of putting in a similar amount of chips uh by calling two streets as you would uh, mm -hmm. just like three betting big. Mm -hmm. So not necessarily. I mean, most most boards, I mean, yes, you're going to end up calling, especially if, if you just face like a third pot C bet. But let's say he calls with ace king, no spade, and the the flop's like seven, six, five, two spades. And let's say uh, Vogel saying bets like half pot on that flop. I would probably find a fold there because, for one, that's a board that Vogelsang's not going to be betting his entire range on. So when he does bet, he's probably a little bit stronger than he should be. That's why you would see, like, a more polarized size. So I would say some boards, yeah, um, he probably does have some give-ups. But for, like, any kind of relatively dry board, 
where there's like a third pot, uh, third pot C bet size, he probably has to peel at least one, having essentially two overs to any flop. So uh, yeah, yeah, you're just kind of incentivized to play a little bit more passively, really though. Ace two, so I kind of like the fold there, seven bigs. Uh, definitely a tight fold by you and take it, but I also understand with Neymar being in the big blind. Interesting spot here, no tilt, uh, three betting, none all in here. Again, these do become more of a thing here at at final tables because you're less incentivized to just be uh, three bet jamming for your entire stack because obviously when you bust, it's like, you know, a, it's, it's a big deal where there's so many uh, massive uh, pay jumps uh, here. So although in normal chip EV terms, you don't see a lot of three bet not all in uh, for 20 big blinds, but at a final table, it would make a lot more sense. You see Watmos doubling up there, a very standard spot. I'm curious I included a fold there on the button. What's up? The ace 10 suited that he just folded on the button. I'm curious about that. Um, yeah, that's too tight. <laughs> I actually didn't even notice that. He absolutely has to be calling here. Um, pretty, yeah, definitely a tight fold. I mean, again, I guess I can kind of get behind it with P. Vigar, uh, being so short here. And also Wizzo has him covered. So, um, if like, let's say no tilt had 32 bigs and Wizzo had 27, like, yeah, maybe he'd be a little bit more incentivized to stick it in because if he does run into a cooler, uh, he's still going to be alive. So it's definitely on the tight side, but I can understand why he did it with P Vigor uh, being so short here. And this is just a cooler of the spot here. think of there. It's because this guy is very, very short. Yeah, it's yeah. It has to be that. It mm -hmm. has to be that. Fours has to fold here. This would be way too loose. Uh, H. Jack's going to call. Was the three bet by Jack there a shove? No, it was three bet not all in. And then Wizzo four bet jammed. Yes. Okay, got it. Yeah, Wizzo shipped it. It was like 3.2 or 3.5 three bet. Yeah. It was around uh, seven bigs, I think. 100% standard, like final table ICM situation, like uh, to four bet ship the ace king there? Um, in Wizzo shoes here? Yeah, exactly. Like, is this basically like we're always getting it in in this situation with Ace King in this kind of ICM spot? Yeah, this this hand's essentially like it's it's way too strong to do anything but uh but jam here. Also, these are very strong, capable opponents here. Like Watmos is a very strong player, so he's definitely going to have the proper amount of bluffs here in the big blind here. So if Wizzo is just you know calling or like hero folding a spot like Ace King here, I think it would be a massive punt. Uh, I, it's a little bit of a different situation. Let's say this is, you know, final table of the Sunday Million, you know, 10,000 player field, and he's playing against a guy who has like, you know, a thousand games played on Shark Scope and has really tight numbers and probably doesn't have much of a three bet bluffing range here. Then I could maybe get behind either, you know, call, well, maybe calling. I mean, we're never folding here, obviously, but against opponents who are capable of bluffing here, like Ace King is just way too strong. This is just a standard setup here where. Uh, these opponents are just going to get the money in, and there's, you know, kind of nothing you can do in this spot. So that's just kind of the way poker goes sometimes. You're just going to run into these really, you know, cooler of spots here, and uh, there's just going to be nothing you can do about it. Well, can I have a question, Kurt? Sure. Does, does Watmos ever have bluffs there, though? I absolutely. Mean, absolutely. Uh, if you're if you're strong enough, I mean, even, go ahead. Even though there's a guy with 342k, and we see Wizzo kind of opening, what, under the gun plus one? Uh-huh. You think he has bluffs there with like a 25 big blind stack or whatever he has? Yeah, absolutely. Um, if, like I said, these, um, if you have a three betting range here, you need to have bluffs to to counter your value range. Otherwise, your opponents can just fold any hand here. So your three bet bluffing range might not be too wide, just like your three bet for value range is not going to be very wide here. Like, let's say if he has like pocket tens or pocket nines or even a hand like ace queen. I would not be surprised to see Watt and Los just call here because those are like good hands, but not so not so good that you just kind of fist pumping, uh, getting it in in a spot like this when P Vigor is so short. 
but um, you are going to have, like, let's say Jax is still kind of thin, honestly, with P. Vigar being so short, uh, but it's probably fine. So let's just say he's going like Jax plus Ace King uh, where he's doing this. And then he's going to um, fill out his three bet bluffing range with, let's say, a hand like like uh, Ace five offsuit or, or even like Ace four suited. Um, he could have some like King seven suited that he wants to do this with here. So basically, if you're going to have three bets in the spot for value, you need to have three bet bluffs in spots like this. Otherwise, your opponents are just going to be able to play a really face up strategy against you and these guys are definitely studying the spots where they know the kind of hands that you can three bet for value but they also know the three bet bluffing candidates here too so um it, and then like you said if you think that nobody is bluffing in the spot and you just think your opponent it, and if you're in wizzo's shoes and you think Wantlos is never bluffing this spot then i would be more incentivized to be three bet bluffing here because if you just think like oh this guy's never bluffing in this spot with p vigor you know being so short he always just has the nuts here that should in, uh incentivize you to widen your three bet bluffing range because in wizzo's shoes you're going to be folding tighter against him if you think he's never bluffing right yeah thank you makes sense yeah absolutely so just in general um these guys are going to be balanced with their three betting uh ranges for value and bluffs and if you're kind of unfamiliar with them yourselves, and even I need to study these uh, myself a little bit stronger, um, definitely just check out the charts and just see um, not only how strong we can 3-bet for value here, but what our best 3-bet bluff candidates are. That's also one of the advantages of having a not shoving 3-bet range with the stack size where we're probably accustomed to shoving, like the 18 to 25-ish. Like, uh, mm -hmm. a lot of us are probably shipping that on three bets, like, all the time. But because it's the final table dynamics where they're just doing, like, a, you know, traditional 3x or whatever, mm -hmm. if you have your entire three betting range, including the bluffs, mm -hmm. uh, doing that, then it does, you know, open up to them reshoving on you Correct. Uh, when you can have the goods. So it, I can see why that actually makes tons of sense. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And and again, at final tables, we, we are absolutely less incentivized to just be three bet jamming our entire stack here because when we put our stack at risk and we get called, it's like a bigger deal to end up busting in a spot where pay jumps are so massive at this spot. So we get to incorporate more three bet non all in strategies at final tables where like where it's like, let's say we're playing just a standard chippy V kind of scenario where we might just have more like three bet jams because that importance of uh, you know, busting out isn't isn't nearly as important in the early to mid stages of a tournament as it gets to the final table here for sure. So this is why you're going to see more three bet non all in sizes at final tables and and maybe some strategies that you don't recognize from your chippy v charts that are being used at final tables. Yes, sir. <laughs> there he is. Okay, so let's skip ahead here a little bit. Neymar getting saucy here. Okay, here's a little bit of Brazil here. You can only hide it for so long. No, no. I was open a lot with this chip set. Yeah, it's fine. I mean, it's close, but, you know, I don't hate it. Yeah, like, I mean, big blind's probably going to be folding too much, a little bit too much there. It folded to him too, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's looking too crazy. Okay, so we see a C bet here by uh, by Anje, which is probably all right. Um, this board's gonna be fairly decent for him, um, but again, he is betting into two different opponents, so you have to be a little bit on the tighter side with your C bet frequencies as opposed to if we were just heads up here. Now, I don't mind this exact hand for him to be uh, C betting here because if this does check around, there's just gonna be so many bad turn cards for him that uh, his aids is, is kind of go going to go down in value here a lot. Now, let's say he has a hand like pocket queens or pocket jacks. I would be a little bit more incentivized to be checking here because these hands need a little bit less protection from over cards. So I would probably be a lot more high frequency check with queens and jacks and then maybe just bet a hand like eights and sevens, a little more high frequency here uh, just to kind of clear out space and find out where you're at. Because if you just get folds here, I mean, that's a pretty big win. And we can also bet like a really small size here. So when we get called and end up losing the pot, we're not losing a ton of money. We're risking very little to win quite a bit. So I kind of like the bet here with eights. 
I wouldn't hate a check either, though, for what it's worth. <coughs> and then once he gets to the turn, I wouldn't be surprised to see another bet here. Um, he unblocks flush draws that are going to be calling him, which is kind of sweet. Uh, because he's probably not going to get a hand like... Uh, like a hand like ace five is never folding. Ace four suited is never going to fold. Uh, and he's also, yeah. So, and, and then if he gets check raised, he probably has the easiest fold ever. Um, I wouldn't be surprised to see you win take it. Just call twice here with a king. And then, um, does the dog want to chime in? <laughs> I thought the dog had something to say. <laughs> I, I don't know if the dog is saying he agrees with it or. <laughs> so anyway, yeah. So on the turn here, I kind of like the bet. He does unblock flush draws that can potentially call here twice. And then he's just going to pure check back the river. Uh, I think he can kind of do either or. I might check back a little bit more with the eight of spades. But uh, I don't hate the double barrel here either. Uh, he can definitely get called by worse. And then if he gets check raised, he has a pretty easy decision uh, once it gets to the river here. So I like the double barrel here. And you wouldn't take it probably has to fold without an overcard. He could also potentially be dead. He could be up against stronger flush draws. So uh, I like the fold there. Whoa, what happened here? So want those opens here. And we get the snap check on the flop. What do you guys think about that? The what? Wow, what? Looks what? like a flop Steve would get. <laughs> Definitely not a flop I would check. <laughs> what the fuck? Yeah, for sure. I don't know. I hate that check. That's, I mean, I, I should let everyone else count them, but it's... Okay, so... Be an agreement. So, yeah, let's have this be the first one we get everybody in on. Um, what do you guys think? Okay, let's say in general... Yeah, I guess what do you guys think about the check? Would you have checks in your range here? And if so, why? Not on ignition. <laughs> not on ignition. <laughs> E flu says he likes it, very explo. Uh, that's a move. I bet small in these monotone flops. Yeah, I think if we are gonna bet, uh, the small bet is probably going to be the best one. Uh, Slammer says bet. Found a flood says small bet. One big blind. He's definitely been on the Odin trail. Odin for the win. Yep. Try that on ignition, I dare you. <laughs> we got to buy five X raise you with a seven, you know, yeah. six. All right, so so Steve, I guess uh, you don't like the check here, so yeah, throw in your two cents. I think this is one of those uh, boards you should be just probably betting your whole range on. I think you have a pretty decent range advantage, so I'm probably putting a really small bet in no matter what. I also think with a hand like this, you could. I I feel like Odin's probably gonna tell you to just go small, but I. I don't like necessarily hate maybe no probably if actually going small makes the most sense when I'm kind of like wrapping my brain around it you don't want to get in the fold of six x you want to fold maybe call like some I don't know crap flush draws that he has or some kind of like seven of hearts or like you know like a ten of hearts or like a five of hearts so I think it's just a small bet probably with your whole range makes sense on this board okay uh so a couple things for one I think the small bet is going to be best here because um we are going to have hands that aren't flushes that want to be betting here for value slash protection. So if we bet really big, we're kind of going to fold out those hands that we want to call that we're, you know, that we're essentially beating here. Let's, let's say we have a hand like pocket nines with a heart and we end up betting, you know, 140 K on the flop. If I have like six, five of diamonds, I'm probably just folding. Right. So because it, I mean, he's betting a pretty big size here. My hand has a very little potential to improve on turns and rivers. And uh, but if we end up betting like, uh, let's say, 70K or 80K here on the flop, then we have to defend a little bit uh, of a wider portion of our range. Otherwise, we just let our opponent kind of get away with betting really small and we're not defending enough. So they're just going to end up uh, making a lot of money just betting a very small size here. So. Uh, I guess that covers it with the like with the size that we're gonna use here. Now, again, going back to what I was saying about final table dynamics, uh, since Wattenlos is covered by Anjay here, um, even though Odin might tell us that we want to see bet pretty aggressively here, in general, we need to be tightening up our c betting ranges a little bit more. Now, I'm a big proponent. 
for C betting very aggressively in most situations. But once final tables come up, uh, that dynamic changes quite a bit because every chip is worth so much and you're going to be less incentivized to be putting in money light, either with like really weak semi bluffs or weak value hands uh, because each chip is worth so much money. Also, on the flip side, uh, Anjay does have Watt and Lowe's covered. So, you know, if he just starts piling in money here, if he does have a hand like, let's say, Queen Jack of Spades here and he just gets check raised, he's like, fuck, I probably have to call here, but this really, really sucks. You know, how am I going to defend on multiple streets here? So, like, even though I might pure C bet a spot like that in chip EV terms, once it comes to a final table dynamic, I'm definitely going to consider uh, checking back some stronger hands like that. Now, with the 9-8 specifically, I'm sure he's not pure checking here, but I absolutely don't hate it as an option. Again, going back to the fact that Anjay does have Watt and Lowe's covered. Even if, even if Watt and Lowe's, like bets here and Anjay check raises and then just double barrel uh, or barrel barrels it off for his entire stack on like a dry runout, let's say it's just like a deuce of, a deuce of spades, seven of spades runout, and he just ends up getting it in here for 100 bigs effective with a nine high flush, like... Yeah, you probably can't fold, but I mean, are you going to be good here that often? I mean, essentially, Anjay is representing like a hand with, you know, like Ace of Hearts 4, or he just has like a King High or an Ace High Flush, and you're just getting in a ton of money in a spot that really sucks when you have P Vigar being so short and No Till also being relatively short here too. So I would say this hand absolutely is not going to be like a pure check or a pure bet here. But I definitely see some uh, some reasoning for him uh, checking back here. And then also at the same time, if he's capable of checking back strong hands here, then Anjay can't just blast off uh, thinking that Watanlos never has flushes here, so he can just be very aggressive. If Watanlos is capable of having flushes here, then that's going to prevent Anjay from being able to just exploitably go really crazy here, and then Watanlos is just not going to have a strong enough hand to defend versus turn river aggression here. So, any of that makes sense? You would be probably splitting betting here, I assume, most of the time with the nine high flush. Like, I think the weaker the flush, the more we can check here a little bit, uh, because again, it, it's the uh, there is potential for us to just run into a cooler here. Like, let's say Andre has king four of hearts or ace four of hearts. Like, that's really gonna suck. Uh, so we might see like um, we end up not winning a big pot when we just check back, but we also prevent ourselves from getting coolered and losing a massive pot in a spot with that we're probably not going to be able to hero fold with a spot like this. So I would definitely mix up my play here. I think betting is good and I think checking is good here. And I absolutely understand like in an FT dynamic that we probably, this hand plays better as a mix, uh, especially with Anjay covering. Now if stacks were the other way around, let's say Watt and Lowe's has 70 bigs and Anjay has 50, then maybe he C bets a little bit more aggressively because he doesn't have to worry about getting stacked by Anjay the times that he does get coolered. You know what I mean? Like a 10 high flush, so let's say a 10 nine of hearts, you're betting here on the flop, right? Well, let's not get too complicated with it. I mean, you can kind of just do whatever here, I think. I wouldn't be surprised to see like a hand like, let's say ace king of hearts or ace 10 of hearts to be checking, uh, to check back here. Because also with the ace king of hearts or the ace 10 of hearts, you're blocking those hands. Like, let's say if you have ace king of hearts, you block the times that Andre is going to have a hand like king four of hearts. So when you really get that cooler set up, um, he's not going to have hands like that because you block that. The same with if he has, uh, if Watanlos has ace 10 of hearts, you block the hands like 10 nine of hearts, 10 eight of hearts that um, you could potentially stack and win a massive pot like that. So I would be a little bit more incentivized to even, even check back with a hand like ace king of hearts and ace 10 of hearts, and then maybe bet more so with like ace deuce of hearts, ace four of hearts, because then you unblock the part of uh Anjay's possible range that actually has like you know mediocre flushes in the spot too so uh, I don't think we have to get too complicated into it I mean that is kind of being a little nitpicky those are just little um little rules that I've kind of noticed and what hands we want to kind of slow play uh, or what flushes we want to slow play and which ones we want to bet aggressively so um I think just in general we want to be mixing it up here in a situation like this. Uh, and we especially have to be aware of the fact that Anjay does have us covered. And that even if we do get in stacks for 50 bigs with a nine high flush and the board just runs out really clean, we're not super happy about it. Like we are not happy about it. There's still like 10 high, king high, ace high flushes that all have us beat. Uh, and if we're saying they're gonna stack us every single time, then we're just, if we see bet the flop every time, then we're just gonna get stacked and coolered every single time. Whereas if we end up putting some check here, uh, we kind of prevent ourselves from running into coolers and also we disguise the strength of our hand so we can potentially get Anjay to just kind of like 
barrel off really aggressively. Let's say, for example, Anjay has a hand like King-9 with a King of Hearts. I would expect him to be super aggressive and to be piling in a lot of money here. So in that way, we can just call call when he's making these massive bet sizes and then win a huge pot where he has nothing. You know what I mean? So you kind of have to look at it from both perspectives, really, and not be so results-oriented in the situation. So yeah, interesting spot here. Uh, if anybody else wants to throw in uh, another comment about the spot before we move on. Definitely a spot where I would say I'm betting 100% at, at, in these spots, like in game. So it's interesting to hear this. I was just trying to give the chat this different perspective and thinking about it at different levels. So cause I do think I have been, with the specific like, flush based betting, just here 100% mm -hmm. in uh, what spot. Yeah, and then you're more incentivized to be playing a little bit more tricky against, like, really capable players. Uh, I think if you're playing against just, you know, random people who don't really understand how, you know, you construct ranges and and uh, and aren't just really capable of bluffing like these other strong regulars are, I think maybe you're a little bit more incentivized to play more of an ABC kind of strategy against weaker, weaker players. And then when you're playing against stronger players, uh, you're a little bit more incentivized to be a little bit more unpredictable. You know what I'm saying? I think DMC wanted to say something. I have a question. Like, yeah, like, so in the final table, uh, we're at the spot that it's, you know, potentially the biggest score that you've ever had. Mm -hmm. uh, what stack depth are you stopping uh, trying to set up, like, future spots where you're going to check back so that you have, you know, the top pair in your range for future spots or whatever? Like, because it seems like you have to make the decision to go for, like, maximum, uh, you know, value in the you know, absolute hand that you're playing at some point, right? Because, mm -hmm. like, I know maybe 50 bigs, there's going to be something, like, an hour later that maybe you set up by, you know, checking a hand that you could have squeezed an extra street of value out of. Mm -hmm. So when do you, like, make that choice as far as just going for maximum value on one hand versus, uh, you know, setting up, uh, you know, future uh, spots where you're going to keep them from bluffing you or whatever? So it's as a balance. It, it's actually a really good question, like related to balancing yeah go ahead Kurt. Sorry, mm -hmm. sorry to say that. no yeah sorry um but as a general rule of thumb the deeper you are with your opponent the more cautious you want to be playing there because then when you get cooler it's more of a mistake when you get in all those chips and then let's say you have 15 to 20 big blinds here it's going to be less of a mistake to kind of stack off and um you know when you're only 15 to 20 bigs here and you run flush to flush then it's just kind of like whatever you know that's just kind of a setup you know stacks are going to get in like you're way too short your hands way too strong you're just always going to get the chips in and if you get cooler it kind of is what it is but if stacks are like 50 big blinds effective uh you could probably prevent some of those coolers from actually happening and again you're a little bit more uh or a little less incentivized to be like putting in a lot of money against somebody who has you covered because then the times you do get cooler it's more painful because you're so deep stacked in a spot like this. So just in general, the deeper you are, probably the more cautious you want to be if you're going up against another big stack, especially when there are other shorter stacks uh, at the final table that have the potential to bust out, uh, you know, relatively soon. So um, yeah, it would it, stack size is definitely a big proponent to whether or not you want to start playing a little bit more passively. So uh, good question there for sure. you're playing like we kind of talk about this a lot i guess this is more relevant maybe in the middle of the tournament but you don't want to be going for let's say super thin value maybe an nft in general as much but like also against better players maybe if you have like if you're playing against guys who you know can't bluff in certain spots okay it's a little bit different of a spot maybe to go for a little bit of thinner value still at an nft you should be more careful about that i think in general at an nft because there's every chip matters so much mm -hmm. you have to be very conscious and know that you have that read but you know, it's a lot different, let's say, if you're playing a guy like, you know, I don't know, Angie or one of these, or you win take it, or if you're playing some regular guy at like a $400 tournament um, who's very nervous, who's never been deep in a tournament, who's never going to make like a bluff in a tough spot on you. So it's, it, it does also, I think that has a little bit of influence kind of in your decision. Mm -hmm. More in the middle of the tournament, but I think even at an FT, it definitely has an influence, obviously. Yep. Uh, uh, the caliber of player definitely comes into these factors here as well. So, um, yeah, we'll keep going. Guess we didn't see how this hand played out. Definitely has to bet for value there on the river. So pretty standard. Uh, he wasn't going to get NJ to put in any more money. Probably going to see an open on the button. Yep. 
think Andre's going to bet and check here. I think either or is fine. Uh, again, he wants to be a little less incentivized to be C-betting into Neymar. But the board's pretty good for him in general. I actually kind of like this lead here by Neymar. Um, so again, we do see, like, uh, this is a little more than half pot here. So he's kind of getting to the area where he's starting to polarize his range to, and it's not going to have as much 9x and 10x in it. It's going to be more strong, uh, like some straights, strong king x and good draws. So when he bets this big, there's going to be a lot less 9x in his range. And Neymar will have more 9x in his range here. So this is actually a pretty baller lead here. I, I like the spot a lot. His hand's good for it. Uh, it makes sense for him to be donk leading here. Andre shouldn't have so much 7x. And, uh, is he, it just me or did he get more? Yeah, sorry, did, I, like, right now. Oh, is it? Are you just lagging a lot? Let's see if you're oh, sorry. Oh, shit. I thought that was like my connection. But yeah. No, it's mine. Uh, it I says. I want to make sure it wasn't just me or not. No, no, Kurt's lagging. Kurt's the mic. Yeah, yeah. It says my connection's bad. I might uh, just disconnect and reconnect here real quick, guys. Okay, do have a bit of a stronger connection now, so hopefully everything's okay now. It sounds a lot better. Okay, cool. Yeah, I don't know why that just uh, lately um, I've been getting booted from these these sessions here. It happens. Assume everyone else is gonna fold here. First time I ever tried to do a multi-way video call on Discord. First time I ever tried to do a multi-way video call on Discord, like two people work, three people's cameras work, no one else works, even though like everyone's stuff was working. So Discord definitely. I've had people good. who could can't even get into VC, like for work calls. It's Discord's just been a heat sometimes. Yeah, but it's only been like that recently for me, actually, like the last week, week and a half. Pretty small three bet here. I think we didn't see that hand. So, yeah, can you guys see this right now? Yeah, it's saying my connection is like really poor. Hold on just a sec. I'm going to switch my internet here. Come on. Let's try this one. Lost, you lost the video. No, sorry. I just I wanted to disconnect everything just to try to yeah. this other one here. So hopefully we're okay now. I, I, I don't know if you heard DMC, but he was saying that you can lower the quality of the video if you have to. Like, oh, that's actually a good point. So I do have actually, it at 1080. On Discord, we're talking about on Discord actually, but oh, yeah, maybe that'll help too. Maybe that'll help too, but whatever. Okay. It's fine right now. Let's just roll with it. It's fine. Okay. But you can lower it on Discord. I can show it to you later if you can't figure that out this moment. Okay. Cool. Uh, so yeah, we get a three bet here by uh, no tilt in the big blind. Uh, he's obviously going to be very polarized in this spot. Um, size is probably okay. He could probably go like 350 here. I might like a little bit more. Uh, but maybe if he's just being kind of face up against a guy like Neymar, who might not be as uh, savvy to a size like this, uh, I might be okay with him using this uh, size kind of exploitably. Uh, I don't want to say anything too bad because Neymar is played pretty well here so far like a lot better than i expected um the fold's also probably good too even though he's getting a good price like no tilt is going to be very um very polarized in this spot easy iso here i would expect no tilt to probably fold here oh he does call so i was gonna say i think jack nine would definitely be a call here but jack eight's a little bit on the loose side against a guy like neymar who's gonna put on a fair amount of pressure Should be checking the turn here quite a bit. Yeah, I don't like this double barrel by him. His hand's not really good for it. He can still show down. Like, um, he does get a, I mean, again, he gets a worse hand to fold. So, yeah, I, I, I don't like it a lot. The bet on the flop's kind of whatever, but the double barrel's a little too aggressive. Board's also not really good for his range. It's probably a lot better for the limp caller's range. 
So let me go back here. This looks like it got interesting. So we get a limb check here. Go check, check. This seems fine. Uh, bet by Neymar is fine. He can also check here. Uh, I like the raise by Watt and Lowe's here. Obviously with the gut shot straight and the nut flush draw. Uh, I think he can call as well. I think both options are going to be fine. Uh, I think he probably wants to raise a little bit more the weaker his ace high flush draw is. Obviously, ace five, one of his weaker aces here. So, definitely like the raise. And he gets there on the river. So, what did he raise to? I actually missed that uh, turn bet. He raised four rex versus, uh, versus a min bet on the turn. So the thing is, he's not going to have like ace queen here ever. But versus a small bet, he can definitely raise a hand like like jack ten, king ten, uh, obviously queen nine, stuff like that uh, for value. And then of course he's gonna have like queen x of clubs, ace x of clubs, stuff like that. Maybe some nine x of clubs that can be uh, decent semi bluffs for him in this spot. So although he never has the absolute nuts, he still probably has hands strong enough to raise here for value. Um, that being said, I think like Neymar could put on a lot of pressure here, knowing that Watnlos cannot have the nuts here. Like Watnlos, once it goes check check on the flop or uh, uh, limp call or limp check, sorry, on the flop, uh, Watnlos essentially never has pocket kings, pocket jacks, pocket tens, ace queen because he would definitely uh, isolate all those hands pre flop. So um, I would say Watnlos has to be a little cautious of that fact as well. So um, like it would be kind of baller if Neymar put in a three bet here, honestly, um, kind of merging his hand a little bit. But um, yeah, obviously like calling is standard here. I also think the raises is, is probably fine. Just kind of interesting the fact that Watt most can never have the nuts or like strong sets here. And yeah, he just snap calls with a two pair on the river here versus 350. I mean, he probably can't fold here. Uh, although it's close, we, I mean, I guess his bluffs really are going to be like if he has like queen four of clubs here, he probably has to bluff his hand. I don't think like queen four is going to be good by the time he gets to the river. Maybe. I don't know. But the thing is like if he's semi bluffing nine X of clubs, like that's a straight, obviously a six of clubs makes a straight. So it's kind of hard to see what want most bluffs are here on the river. So if I'm in Neymar shoes, like it's really gross. Uh, it's just, but like I said, I think it's hard to see what bluffs want most has in this spot that don't get there on the river. Really? So yeah, interesting spot for sure. No, he called. Yeah, dude, he's Brazilian. He's not folding two pair. I didn't think he was. I actually got to bounce out on that note because I got a meeting here coming up in a little bit. But all right, cool. I was supposed to leave like thirty minutes ago, but too good of a session. Couldn't couldn't leave. Like like I was just writing in the chat. Even for me and Kurt, this is such amazing, studying information. I should say a lot. Some people who play professionally for that long at such high levels still get a lot of this. You could imagine that you guys are going to get some fun from this too. So Yeah, I really like these sessions here. And definitely the fact that we're getting a, a lot of uh, participation from all the members in here too. So, um, I, yeah, so, uh, yeah, Steve, thanks for uh, joining us. Uh, we're going to go another half hour here since we did start the video a little bit late. We usually take questions at the end of a session, but we, since we did a few of those in the beginning, I guess we got a lot of that out of the way. I'll probably still take a few questions by the end. And uh, I guess we can have uh, Max kind of fill in for you here on the end. And uh, yeah, we'll go for yep, that. I'm here. All right, perfect. Just uh, like I said, just uh, try to keep an eye on the chat for me because I've been uh, kind of lacking there. So if anybody has any decent points that we need to stop and address, that'll be cool. Uh, Steve, thanks for joining us. And uh, yeah, we'll keep going. Gonna be an open here from the ace eight. Uh, I would ex eight three is gonna be kind of close here. I think. Yeah. So I'm not surprised to see a fold there. Usually you want to be calling like any two suited cards uh, uh, in the big blind uh, at all stack depths, but we are a little less incentivized to be calling super wide when we are at final tables. So we might we're definitely gonna be calling a little bit tighter. So not surprised to see the fold with the eight three. Isn't your theory to? call a little bit wider the shorter your stack is um in the big blind yeah or yeah in general absolutely um because you can't because you're you end up the shorter you get the higher percentage of a stack that you're folding out also the shorter you are the easier it's going to be to stack off with any kind of decent hand like top pair or draw 
uh, where it, it, you know, a little bit more uh, reverse implied odds uh, start to come into effect the deeper stack you get. Uh, now, that's going to get thrown out the window a little bit when ICM implications are on the table. So, um, like, yeah, you do want to still be defending relatively wide, but you're also less incentivized to be putting in money, uh, like, a little on the loose side because your opponents can put a lot of pressure on you. You just, in general, have to be a lot tighter in these situations than you would normally be in a standard uh, chip EV uh, kind of format. Okay, I understand. Yeah. I was going to say, wouldn't it be surprised to see a better check here? I think you can probably mix. I think this king's really good for you when take it, and his hand's also worth almost nothing, so I would expect a bet here. Uh, Want most probably has to call. Uh, interesting river here. Uh, I was going to say, I wouldn't be surprised to see a donk lead here. Not sure how much I like the size here. He's obviously trying to represent a jack here, and I think a jack would definitely want to be betting for a bigger size here. So the lead is, like, kind of whatever here on the river. I mean, it might be okay. Again, I'm not super sharp with these river donk uh lead spots here uh i would just uh, assume on the river if we're trying to represent a jack we would want to be using a bigger size here oh. yeah i mean th there is something to be said for like you know value bet bluffing but you're also literally giving that pricing them in to call right right a decent bit of the portion of the time so like <laughs> Yeah, you know, it, it's one of those things where like you are telling the story, you are representing a, a jack by betting small, but you, I mean, you're literally giving them the the odds to call. So right, right. Um, you know, you probably just want to bet thicker in those spots in general, just because some people, especially in like uh, like smaller buying tournaments, are just gonna call anyways, just because they're like, oh, I'm getting four to one, or oh, I'm getting six to one. Right. Like I have to call. Right. So, Agreed. For can sure. you, can can you, you go back on Ace's hand? Yeah, I was going to ask the same thing. This one right here? That, that six is fold. I'm probably floating the flop here, if I'm being honest. Wow, six is just, just folded here, huh? Mm hmm. Plus, the ace is bet. Yeah, which is fine. I mean, this well, board. Yeah, I don't need to bet. bet. I, I hate the fold. <laughs> so. I don't necessarily well, hate it. I mean, Andre. Yeah, uh, he also has to worry about the big blind too, I guess, which is kind of whatever. I mean, Vogel saying's call here is actually a little aggressive here too. Uh, but that being said, um, again, Andre's range does have to be a little bit tighter since he is betting into two opponents. Uh, but that being said, this board is definitely better for his range than it is for everybody else's. Um, I don't hate the fold here because essentially, if he check calls a flop. He's probably going to have to fold to every single turn bet here. And he's kind of just avoiding getting himself into a sticky situation here. Like he can already be dead on the flop, as we see here. Um, he can be essentially dead to at, like pocket sevens plus. So it might look like a like a really easy check call here. Uh, and it's definitely like on the tight side, but I absolutely don't hate it because it's certainly close. Like, like for chips, yeah, it, it's probably a call. But uh, I don't hate him folding and not wanting to blow the pot with, um, you know, and he has another player to act as well. So I, I don't necessarily hate this fold, but I would consider it tight for sure. That makes sense. Yeah. Can you show the preflop action here? Like, it looks like a three-bet pot, right? No, no, no. It, it just no, went no, open from the hijack. And it went no call in the blind. Right, right. Yeah. And the 10 is definitely a let, yeah, uh, loose mean, I guess peel. He's out, of, he's out of position, and there's not going to be even, like, you know, the probability of good runouts where it feels comfortable calling, like, even two streets, let alone three streets. It, it does make sense to just, you know, sort of, sort of yeah. evacuate early. There's, like, so many spots where he's just dead to, like, so many hands. Yeah. Like, he's dead to pocket sevens plus. He's dead to an ace. Uh, and then if he's even betting a hand like Jack-10, like, Andre can put a lot of pressure on him where he's just essentially never able to call a double barrel either. So his hand just has very little potential to not only defend, but to also improve. So for those reasons alone, I really don't hate the fold. It might look tight in general, but um, I actually, now that I'm considering it, I actually really like it uh, a lot more because even like, like I said, Andre's going to be able to put on a lot of pressure, like if want most calls and, and uh, Volga saying folds, he's essentially going to be able to double barrel uh, pretty aggressively. And even hands like Jack-10, 10-9, uh, King-Jack are going to be able to put on a lot of pressure here too. Uh, and then he just has a hand that's never going to be able to call a double barrel. So, What if you have like 10? Well, 10s would make a lot more sense because then Andre could be betting a hand like 
uh, nines through sixes uh, for value here. So there's a lot more hands he would bet in that uh, he would be beating in this situation as opposed to like a hand like pocket sixes that like Andre's essentially going to be betting like sevens plus for value. Um, there's a chance that he could be betting pocket fives and get some of the fold, but there's like way less, you know, pocket fives and pocket fours. And then there's just way more like ace X and then sevens plus that he's losing to. So if he is winning here, it's like he's losing to more of Andre's range than he's actually beating here. So um, I'm kind of okay with the fold here. Yeah, I definitely okay. learned something from this spot. That was great. Okay. This cool. is one of those spots, though, where I was like kind of mentioning earlier, where you flop the quad aces in position, mm -hmm. and then you bet uh, and get folds. Mm -hmm. um, how are you not wanting to check that? I know that you're, you know, obviously maintaining your C bets like on any any board there that's good for you. But how are you not trying to check that and make it like the absolute maximum value you can uh, from that hand, given that it's a final table for like, you know, like I was saying, the biggest score of your life? Okay. So you're going to have bluffs in the spot too, right? And Andre's shoes? Like, so basically we have come up with the fact that this is probably a better board for Andre than the rest of them. So that in general, like we can be relatively aggressive with our range. And it can't just be bluffs and, like, pocket eights plus. Like, we have to have some strong hands in there as well. And then at the same time, like, if we just check back and, let's say, Watmos does have pocket nines, pocket tens. If we just check the flop, then we're only getting two streets maximum. And we're not really putting on a lot of pressure for that weaker part of Watmos's range. So, um, yeah, maybe the check gets in there sometimes. I wouldn't hate it, but I definitely wouldn't just be pure checking here because then if we do, obviously, like whenever we bet, we never have an ace, and that's kind of a kind of a problem. Uh, this is definitely a hand we can get three streets from, so I wouldn't mind betting here on the flop. He's also betting a really small size here, which means he can be doing this with a relatively wide range. Like I said, he can even be doing this with hands like jack ten of diamonds, stuff like that, and then he can he can make a hand like pocket sixes fold. So so essentially, you can bet really small and get strong hands like this to fold for a very small price. So he's going to be very incentivized to bluff in this spot, but he has to counter that bluffing range with some value range here as well. So we can't just be pure checking a hand like this, especially when this board is probably more favorable to our range than their range. So yeah, it kind of sucks when we get folds and they have nothing, but at the same time, like if we're going to be bluffing here, we need to be betting here for value as well, especially on a board that's relatively good for us. And we need to be pressuring the stronger parts of their range that are going to potentially call two streets, maybe three streets, uh, depending on the run out. Not relevant to the question as much, but in the cash game situation, if you're in a live scenario where there's jackpots and there's three aces on board, you're really incentivized to letting... Uh, someone else qualified for the jackpot. Well, yeah, so, that's a completely different situation for sure. For sure. Like mention it only because it was eight days eight. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I mean, that that would definitely come into the uh, uh, to the equation if, if this was a jackpot hand or something like that where you're more incentivized to show down. So, yeah, in, in that regard, uh, I would be more into uh, checking a little bit more high frequency. So I was going to say this uh, right here. We have an interesting spot where you see you win take it. Uh, obviously for Chippy V, this hand is definitely strong enough to be three betting pure. But we see because, again, no tilt is very short. Uh, and obviously Neymar has you win take it uh, covered. He's going to be less incentivized to blow the pot. So that's why we see a call here. I don't know if this is like, you know, shocking for anybody to see or if they're just like pure three betting this spot. But I ab absolutely like the call here. Standard C-bet here from Neymar. I'd be pretty aggressive here. He can even double barrel this spot here if he wants. Don't really like the size too much, uh, but it's kind of whatever. Is it? What's up? Yeah, I mean, I understand his line, uh, but I don't think that, like, yeah, I think that when he bets a little thicker like that, what do you bet? Oh, I guess it's not that big. It's like 40% pot. So, I mean, he's just more or less locker betting, right? I mean, he, he's just hoping that, that weaker sixes are calling. Yeah, um, I also... I mean, he, go ahead, Max. No, 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 you go ahead. Okay, so I guess this is kind of a good part that, that we brought up here, and this is something you're going to see with a lot of, like, mediocre to weaker opponents. 
Um, I don't think the smaller size really gets in here. Uh, again, once we get to the turn, I mean, obviously he bets really small on the flop. So he's betting like a very wide portion of his range. If not, he's betting every single hand in his range, which he can do because he's betting so small. So he's, uh, you know, ver risking very little uh, to win quite a bit here. Now, once he gets to the turn, he's ob and he gets to the turn with every hand in his range, obviously he can't just double barrel all those hands. So once he decides to bet on the turn, he's going to be betting a more polarized type of range here. Basically hands that are good enough to bet for value and his better uh, semi bluffs here. So when we want to, again, when we want to polarize our sizes here, we want to start using bigger sizes here. So this size doesn't really make sense. This is a size where he's just basically like, oh, this is how much I think my six is worth. So I'm going to bet here. So this is Neymar playing his hand more so than he should just be playing his range. Now, I absolutely think yeah, awesome slammer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I'm glad you picked that one out here. So this is definitely a concept I want to get you guys uh, uh, more familiar with. Rather than just looking at your hand and realizing like, oh, this is what I think, you know, this hand is worth. So I'm going to bet this size. Realize that once we get to the turn here, we normally want to start polarizing our range. If we are going to have bluffs here, I'm pretty sure we don't want to be bluffing for a small size. We want to be betting a little bit bigger here to maximize our fold equity and put on max pressure against the weaker part of you and take its range as well as when we have strong kings here. We want to be betting for a bigger size so we can build a pot to potentially win a very big one when we have trips. Uh, so yeah, this is essentially something you're going to see with a lot of amateur to mediocre kind of players. They're just going to take their hand and they're going to bet what they think their hand strength is. Now, I actually think Neymar can go pretty big here with the six here because you wouldn't take it. It's going to have some ace high flush draws that need to call. He's going to have where six X that need to call. Uh, he's going to have maybe like some ace three diamonds can even call a double barrel here because they do unblock uh, Neymar's bluffing range. So there's definitely hands that Neymar is going to get uh, called by, even if he bets like two thirds to three quarters here on the turn that are worse than his a six here. Uh, so yeah, I think he can actually bet pretty big here on the turn with this hand. And then obviously once he bets big on the turn, his hand more often than not is not going to be strong enough to bet for three streets of value. So he's just going to auto check the river. So he essentially, um, puts on max pressure against you and take its range and also like really charges, um, any like weaker six X three X flush draws that want to end up calling here. And then, of course, you wouldn't take it. It's going to have a king here sometimes, and then he just checks and loses. But there's, I absolutely see enough hands that Neymar can still get called with uh, that are going to be worse than his specific hand. And then, again, his hand is probably not going to be worth uh, three streets, so he probably just auto-checks uh, any river here. So actually a really good spot that we got to point out here and something I'm going to, uh, in the future, once we do more of these uh, more complex uh, flop, turn, river uh betting strategies here i'm going to make sure that we uh cover this area a little bit here because this might seem like a little i don't know how you guys are taking this obviously some of you are picking up on that i saw slammer nailed that one so uh, but this is going to be kind of a, how we teach you guys to play your range as a and the spot as opposed to just looking at the strength of your specific hand and being like oh i think this hand is worth you know only 40 percent pot here so this is the size i'm gonna bet it doesn't really work like that And well, then you're check. forcing your opponent to bet the river, though, if you're checking uh, on the river with that sort of hand, right? And then, like, you're forcing yourself to also call off uh, a river bet from your opponent when they break all their flush draws. And I'm assuming the opponent, like, they're only, are they checking a three back as well? Uh, once, once we bet the turn here, too? Oh, okay, I can actually see a three river. But um, yeah, once you bet the turn with the a six mm -hmm. uh, and your, your opponent's you know worse hands in, uh, your opponent also has to those hands more often than not on the river, don't they? Sorry, you cut out there for a, what do they do on the river? Are, are you are you asking if we have donk leads on the river and you win take it shoes? Like yeah, if you're Neymar and okay, so he's actually in position. Yeah. He has, I guess just cancel my question entirely. I, I actually didn't see the three peel off on the river there. But um, the idea was if you're if you're betting the turn there with the a6 and your opponent has worse hands that are calling and then the river bricks, mm -hmm. um, isn't your opponent going to have to turn their hand into a bluff? Um, not necessarily. I mean, on the specific three, they probably can. Um, although, th I guess this is a good question. I don't think this particular spot... Uh, you win take it has donk leads in the spot. Like I don't think the three again. Usually when we see donk leads coming in, 
uh, it's because a card is so much better for the donk leader's range than it is for the person who's betting there that they're actually allowed to have a donk leading range. Now, I don't think the three is necessarily strong enough where they can just like pure donk lead. I wouldn't think it would be terrible because Neymar is betting hands like a6, obviously. And then if he's betting a6, he's probably betting pocket sevens through pocket queens here too. So um, if the river comes a three, I'm assuming like most 6x and pocket sevens through pocket queens are going to be checking here. So when we just check all of our threes here, we probably prevent ourselves from getting another bet. So I guess I, I, I kind of take that back. I wouldn't be surprised if we do get some donk lead here on the river. But I don't think it's pure either because Neymar still has all like King X in his range too. So we can't necessarily just blindly, you know, you know, rip in another bet here when we have a three. Also, if we pure donk lead here on the river, then we prevent Neymar from bluffing with certain hands. Like if Neymar has a, a hand like, you know, seven, eight that he just decided to go off with. Um, we kind of prevent him from, from bluffing in these spots. So just because you have a hand that bricks out uh, doesn't necessarily mean you just get to bluff there on the river. The card has to make sense. Uh, like it has to be a better card for your range than your opponents to warrant a donk lead in the first place, which is something I also see from a lot of opponents. They'll check call like twice with a flush draw and then just donk lead a blank river that doesn't make any sense. Like the board is still better for the in position player's range than it is for the out of position's range. And all they kind of see is like, oh, I have a busted flush draw. I have no other way of winning the pot. I have to bluff here. Again, that's not really how it works. Like the board has to make sense. The card has to be so much better for the donk leader's range than the in position player's range to warrant a bet in that spot. And again, we can cover donk leads uh, in the future as well. I'm still studying up on them quite a bit myself. So um, if you guys want to do a little bit more uh, donk leading spots, uh, we can absolutely cover that in the future. So um, yeah, I think this spot in general, you probably get some donk lead but I wouldn't say you can just donk lead every time you have a three here or every time you have a king or or a missed draw here. You know what I mean? I do. Thank you. All right. Cool. All right. Let's keep it going. We got about, um, let's see what time it is here. Yeah, we'll do another 10 minutes here. And then we'll cut it off and probably pick this one up on Thursday. Do a few more hands. And then I'll take, again, I'll take some questions from you guys uh, once we get to the end of it here. What time are you planning to do this on Thursday? Uh, sorry to interrupt. Oh, all good. Uh, it depends. I might go an hour later. I don't know if I'm playing tennis on Thursday. Uh, more than likely, I am. So we might end it up uh, end up doing it an hour later than we normally do. I'll be sure to warn you guys. So, so it'll probably be either uh, it'll either be uh, noon e uh, Eastern time or one or, p.m. Eastern time, right? Correct. Correct. Our normal time has been twelve right, uh, twelve Eastern time. Uh, and then, like I said, if we do adjust it, I'll be able, I'll be sure to let you guys know at least a day ahead of time. And if you want to check out the time, we're going to be posting in uh, the general chat section. And also, you can check out our calendars as well. All the dates and times for the sessions we're going to be running are going to be in our calendar section. So, um, yeah, and also just feel free to ask too. But I, I want to have like a more consistent time here of of getting these things in, but. Um, I also don't want to risk being late if I happen to end up playing tennis that day and you guys are just sitting around waiting for me. So uh, I'll try to give you guys enough of a yeah, heads up a anyway. Lot of are sort of, are, are, a lot of people are sort of marking their calendars and show, you know, because like today we had, I think we had 15 people mm -hmm. at the very beginning of this. So I just want to make sure that we have some clarity so that, you know, because people are looking forward to these things, you know, right. these are, uh, you know, very important and informational. So, yep. yeah. Yeah, so I guess in general, they will be every Tuesday to Thursday at 12 or 1 o'clock p.m. Eastern Time. Mostly it's going to be 12 Eastern Time, but sometimes it's, it's going to be 1. Uh, but it will, it will always be those two days and those two times regardless. So we'll be sure to give you at least a heads up a day in advance of which time it's going to be. All right? That's good, man. All right, cool. So pretty good board for Vogel saying here. Uh yeah, I expect them to be betting a fair amount. Though I wouldn't hate checking since Anjay does have him covered. So it looks like Watt and those opened here. Uh, I wonder, yeah, uh, I think the lower pairs kind of like betting here a little bit more because they require more protection. Also kind of benefit from just getting a, an automatic fold. 
this would be, I was going to say this would be a really good uh, three-bed jam spot. I think these suited broadways are really good for it. Also, Vogelsang should be opening relatively wide. I mean, they're all pretty deep stacked, and uh, no tilt is really, like, he's less incentivized to be, like, opening preflop light and just be ripping it into people who are opening, like, relatively wide. I also think this hand is just good enough to be jamming here. So, I, and I also think Vogelsang is probably going to call it off here with sixes. I think, like, fives probably gets close. Sevens is a pretty easy call. So, uh, good jam by no tilt there, for sure. I was going to run that myself, so I didn't have to ask. But, yeah, that covered it. About uh, about which spot? The sixes. I, I wasn't sure if I was supposed to call off the sixes there or not. It's close. And then, of course... Like uh, chip EV wise, it's it's going to be an easy call. But then once the uh, we have ICM factors uh, in front of us, then um, obviously it's going to be we're going to need stronger hands to be calling with there. So I think he can pretty much call like this is kind of as close to chip EV as it's going to get here because no tilt is like by far the shortest stack here. And even if Vogelsang calls and loses here, he's still going to have 45 bigs. So it's not like he's crippled by calling here and losing. So also when he calls here and wins, he gets a pay jump here. So I think this is kind of as close to like a chippy V call as you're going to find at a final table. Uh, so yeah, I think that in this specific spot, he can play pretty close to uh, a chippy V calling uh, decision, which is kind of uh, something you don't see very often at final tables, but this spot kind of makes sense for it. So definitely an aggressive three bet here from Neymar. I actually really don't like it here. Um, I mean, it's not terrible here. Anjay should be opening very wide here, and Neymar should be three betting a pretty polarized range here. I think Queen Jack is definitely not strong enough to call with. So I do like that he's three betting instead of calling. But that being said, folding might be slightly better than three betting. It's kind of okay though. I, I mean, I don't hate it. Um, like, like I said, Anjay is going to be opening relatively wide, so he's just going to be getting a lot of auto folds. He's still in position, so that's kind of good. Um, he just kind of picks a, a bad time for it. And he absolutely has to fold here now. Yeah. It's the very bottom of his three betting uh, range in is the first really place. Bear at all just flatting in positions with really strong hand bear? Um, in Neymar shoes? in Anjay's spot here instead of four betting. Um, so I don't think King... Okay, so at least from Chip EV uh, charts, I don't think King's here ever flats. Um, I think Aces uh, becomes a little bit more likely to uh, be flatting here, mainly because you're blocking a big part of Neymar's uh, three-bet bluffing range, like with the Ace-10 offs, the Ace-4 suited, stuff like that. Uh, and also he has, you know, aces. He doesn't have to, you know, he has the strongest hand. So um, if Neymar happens to have a hand like queens or kings, uh, there's still going to be plenty of boards where the pot's already kind of bloated and they're still going to be able to get it in on relatively um, dry boards. And then at the same time, um, like I said, he does block a fair amount of, with aces, he blocks a fair amount of Neymar's uh, three-bet bluffing range. So the fact that he has two aces makes it less likely that... Uh, Neymar has uh, a hand that he's three bet bluffing, so I wouldn't hate if he ended up fast playing aces in that spot. But I think you can kind of mix with aces a little bit here. Uh, the, the deeper they are, the more incentivized you are to put in a little bit more money at 60, like 70 bigs here. I think he definitely wants to probably pure four bet with a hand like kings and then probably mix it up with uh, aces, I would say. And then even if, if Andre has a hand like queens, I would not be surprised to see him just flat here. And that's mainly because stacks are so deep and it is like, I don't see Neymar just like getting it in here with like pocket jack super easily. And then like, yeah, he's going to get it in against ace king, but then he's flipping for 70 big blinds effectively. So when there's like really big ICM dynamics in the spot. So um, yeah, good question there. I think for sure. He probably gets some flat with aces uh, because it's so strong and he, and um uh, probably gets to do some calling with queens as well because it's not going to be so many hands that he just gets it in in a dominated situation for 70 big blinds with all of these uh, uh, ICM implications at hand here. Appreciate the answer. Yep, all good.
interesting flop here. I expect uh, Vogel saying wow. to bet pretty aggressively. And Andre can really kind of do a couple things here. He can check call or check raise. I think both are going to work just fine. I think with the pair, uh, a lot of people's natural instinct is to check raise because they, you know, have a hand with quote unquote a lot of equity here. Uh, but it's also makes a really good check call because you can easily check call two streets no matter what the turn is. You know what I mean? And then you also kind of disguise like the fact that you have a three because most three X's are going to have to fold on the turn if they're not like three X of diamonds specifically. So once you do hit a three, your hand is kind of disguised. Uh, and then also like it makes it really easy for you to call twice with your flush draw. But uh, yeah, I think we can kind of do both things here. Now in this spot here, if Vogelsang continues, I expect him to use a relatively like large size. Like I would not be surprised to see anything between 650K and 700K here on the turn. And that's mainly because the board is so open. Uh, there's like a lot of draws out there. It's pretty dynamic. There's straight draws, there's flush draws, but none of those are complete yet. So Vogelsang is really incentivized to put in a lot of money with a strong part of his uh, range to put on max pressure against Anjay's like thin value as well as his strong draws here. So I would not be surprised to see an overbet here. And he bets pot, which is fine, I guess. Again, with ICM uh, factors at hand, you are a little less incentivized to be putting in these massive overbets. As I was saying before with uh, uh, Wizzo Wizzo in that spot where he had the King Jack and he donk led the river. So I kind of understand why he's using pot and this may be the biggest size that he's using here uh, at a final table. And this is kind of thin here on the river. I think, like, Andre's still going to have hands like ace-10, ace-jack that are going to be in a really tough spot. He's going to have ace-7, ace-6, ace-5, ace-4, all these hands that he's beating. He's also going to have a lot of hands like 9x of diamonds here, 3x of diamonds. So um, it's basically, does he expect to get called by worse hands here? And essentially, the stronger players these, uh, these guys are, uh, I think they do find these really thin value bets. I think that's what really makes them very strong players. So it's going to be kind of interesting to see what Vogel saying does here. Uh, I also would hate a check because you are a little less incentivized to go for those thin value hands because for one, uh, your opponent should be a little bit on the tight side with ICM implications. And for two, you're a little less incentivized to go for uh, three streets of value with a, you know, what might be a thin value hand because when you're, when you bet three streets and you're wrong, uh, it's kind of a, you know, it really sucks here to lose those chips. Um, you know, with, with these ICM dynamics here. So he does go for some thin value. I actually kind of like it here. I think if he has a hand like ace-10, maybe he might end up finding a check back. And wow, he heroes him with a three. So, um, and that just goes to show that Anjay knows Vogel saying is capable of being really aggressive on a board that's pretty good for him. And so uh, when you have an opponent who's capable of calling you down pretty thinly in the spot here, uh, I guess it incentivizes Vogel saying to go for some thin value here as well. So this, these are dynamics that you see with like really strong players here quite often. Like you're going to be, you have to make these hero calls uh, with a, a hand like Anjay's quite a bit here because you're going to have opponents who are capable of, of bluffing in this spot where maybe like, you know, less capable players are just going to be way more uh, on the side of value than the side of bluffs here. So uh, definitely an interesting call down. I don't hate it because uh, a lot of like diamond combos, uh, Vogelsang is probably going to be giving up here with on the river. And obviously he blocks diamonds here. And he also blocks hands like, you know, ace three, pocket threes as well. So I really don't hate, uh, in theory, the call here. I mean, in, in terms of his actual hand strength, it doesn't look great. But in terms of blockers and just understanding the spot in general, I don't really hate uh, this hero call here. So, uh, yeah, this is probably a good spot to wrap it up here. We're at about an hour and a half of recording here now. So um, I'll just uh, bring it here, and then on Thursday we can kick it off from here. So, uh, yeah, I guess we can uh, take some questions from you guys. Uh, this was definitely a fun final table here so far. Impressed with Neymar's play for the most part. Uh, yeah, so we'll take some questions if you guys have any. And uh, just to uh, chime in, uh, Kurt, uh uh, did an instructional video. It, what was it? It was like how you study. And yeah. So and, yeah. Uh, go go ahead. Yeah. Just explain what the video is. Yeah. So it's a video I've been meaning to do here for a while. Um, it's basically, I'm just recording myself, showing you guys uh, 
what it looks like when I actually end up studying between using ICMizer, between studying my charts, and then doing a little bit of work with Odin. Now, I'm not going through as many hands because I'm trying to explain things out as we go, but I just kind of want to give you guys a look into what it looks like when I'm like off the tables and I'm doing some study work. So if you're looking to get in, getting into studying yourself, uh, hopefully this will give you like a solid baseline of uh, not only like what programs do I use, but how to uh, efficiently use those as well. So Max should be posting that video here pretty soon. So if you guys want to check that out and uh, any comments you guys want to leave to that as well, I'd be happy to answer. That should be posted here uh, relatively soon. Uh, yes, Slammer, that's awesome. going to be on YouTube. <laughs> we all appreciate you, Kurt. Yeah, I mean, who wouldn't? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, that, you know, that you know, born in men, you know, we we're a confident bunch. Yeah, <laughs> main men. You should be cooler than like 87 other people, so it's not that hard. Yeah, it's not that much. <laughs> Yeah, but Kenny, if you knew me really well, you would understand that it is very hard for someone like me to pull that off. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. Yeah. All right. All right. Cool. So uh, I and have a good one, guys. I appreciate well, you guys coming, and uh, I really appreciate that so many people were showing up like on time, like at the very beginning of the session, because that's just like very good for engagement. So everybody's on the same page from the jump. Agreed. Uh, so just wanted to say I I appreciate all you guys and. Uh, Everybody have a good day. Yeah, and again, uh, Max, if you want to peace out here, I'll just take a few more questions from anybody if they uh, if they want to say what's up. But uh, yeah, thanks again, Max, for joining us here. I gotta go coach kids. All right, all right, all right coach. Catch you on Thursday, bud. <laughs> See ya. I did have a small request for maybe some future content. Okay. Uh, if you could do some maybe pre-flop open sizing content with some different stack size dynamics. Okay. I think that'd be helpful okay maybe uh maybe you could come up with some examples and kind of post those uh in our hand discussion section and then maybe i'll have a little bit more of an idea about what kind of spots you want to cover and then we can address those in another session that we end up doing so that would be cool love that thanks bro all right anytime uh anybody else have any questions okay can you go back to that river bet by vocal song the hand before yep um so is he betting an amount that's also kind of polarized where there's incentive for the three five to call because it's either aces or bluffs like that seems like uh that 900 seems kind of largest to me is that is that just a standard bet you'd make with like nine tier for thin value as well so oh what was that last part you said again real quick sorry like uh it, are we expecting Vogelsang to bet like 10 jacks, uh, nines here? No, no, no. Uh, like, so, no, I, I would say that's too thin there. So essentially once we get to the river, um, we only want to be betting the best hands because essentially what we're saying is we have a hand that's strong enough to bet for value or we have a hand that's good enough to bluff. Uh, basically, and when it gets to betting uh, a more polarized kind of range, we want to be using a more polarized kind of size. Now, anything that's like two thirds pot plus, I would say could be in the more polarized range here. But since uh, this is a little different than the flush spot that we were talking about earlier, because in that flush spot, we had uh, Wizzo Wizzo only representing flushes, which is only the absolute top of his range. And then the rest of it is just going to be good flush blockers. So in that regard, that's why I was saying we want to see like 2x pot or or nothing. So he only has that very large bluff size in that spot. But in a spot like this, uh, Vogel saying doesn't necessarily need to have like trips or better to get three streets of value. So essentially what you want to ask yourself is are there going to be worse hands that are going to call me here? And I think the answer is yes, there are going to be worse hands than ace queen that are going to call here. Like I said, Anjay is definitely going to have ace jack, ace 10, ace 7, ace 6, ace 5. And then he's going to have some uh, hero calling hands like 9x of diamonds, 3x of diamonds. And um, if Anjay's not like defending appropriately, then Vogelsang can just really kind of over bluff here and know his opponent's not going to be calling appropriately. So uh, mainly the two things we want to ask ourselves are, are our opponents capable of calling uh, wide enough? Are they capable of calling worse hands than us? So um, yeah, essentially at the river, we don't really see these like third pot bets here. I think this is also something that we see from a lot of amateur kind of players is they're like, okay, this, this hand seems really thin. So I want to bet a small size to get hero called 
by like a weaker hand. I don't really think that's the way you want to think about it. Honestly, if I saw Vogel saying bet like 300k here and I have five three of diamonds, I'm just going to snap fold. Uh, and then essentially what the other thing you want to ask yourself is do you ever bluff for like 300 or 400k here on the river? Exactly. No, that was kind of my point that uh, NJ makes the call because it's basically an X, uh, an ace or a bluff by Vogelsang. Is that like the line that he's probably thinking here with that uh, river bet? I can see how a smaller one is a snap fold. But then if you're going to hero, he sized it to where it does have, you know, kind of a polarized uh, uh, bet range in in from what I'm seeing. Like I can see why the 3-5 calls the 900 and possibly folds the... 550. Yeah, yeah. So, and I would say this is pretty close to the bottom of Vogel saying's uh, value range here too. But he's not he's not saying like, okay, this is the bottom of my value range, so I'm at a better smaller size to get worse hands to call. What he's saying is, yes, I think there are worse hands to call, and I'm going to still bet the same size as if I had a hand like Ace King here, or maybe even a hand like Ace Deuce would still bet the same size. So essentially, we need to be using more polarized sizes on the river. When we do bet, it's very rare that we use sizes that are going to be smaller than two thirds pot here. And this is also something, like I said, is kind of easy for us to spot against weaker players because essentially rather than just realizing like, oh, I'm on the river, there are gonna be hands that are worse than mine that are gonna call. They don't look at it like that. They're like, okay, this hand's really thin. So I'm gonna bet a really small size in order to get called here. And like I said, essentially, that tells me that it's easier for me to fold because I know if they bet a size like this, they're betting for thin value and they never have bluffs in these spots. So I'm actually more incentivized to call Vogel saying if he bets a size like 900K as opposed to him betting a size like 300K because I know he has bluffs in his range when he bets this big and when he bets small, he never has bluffs. Okay, great. That, that was exactly my train of thought on that. So I'm glad you clarified. Thank you. Okay, cool. Anytime. Uh, anybody else while we're in here? Let me catch up with the chat here real quick. Um, please start recording the sessions now. Yeah, I, I do have the recession recorded today, so we'll make sure that we get this one posted as well. That's another reason I wanted to do that video I was talking about with Max because we did forget to record the session that we had with Pete the other day. So I wanted to make up for that by recording uh, some other content for you guys so you can dig into that as well. Yeah, any other questions before we uh, peace out of here? See Slammer in there. I don't think these recordings should go on YouTube. Too much knowledge. Uh, make them come into Discord. Uh, so that's something you'll have to discuss with Steve. I'm not like that's not my area. I guess I don't make those decisions. I just provide the content. Uh, you probably are onto something like that. And then once the the mint happens, I think this kind of information is going to go more towards um, you know our members here. Uh, more than anything. So you're probably right in that regard as well. Uh, again, definitely take that up with Steve. I think that's a, a valid uh, statement there anyway. So um, we'll absolutely look into that. And Steve should probably be able to provide, uh, provide uh, you know, some more information in terms of that. But that's, that's not my field, I guess. <laughs> yeah, anytime that's a move. No, no, Slammer. I actually, I absolutely think that's, um, that's, you know, a hundred percent warranted in that regard. I mean, the whole thing about this is exclusivity. We want to make sure that we're providing these contents to our loyal members and people who have been active in the uh, Discord here. So I think you're definitely onto something there. It's just going, like I said, that's not that's not my field. I don't make these decisions here. I just provide the content. So definitely bring that up to Steve. Uh, I'm sure he probably will agree with you there. Uh, definitely agree. I think Steve mentioned to me privately that will be more open. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That that makes sense here for sure. Uh, could do five to 10 minute previews. Yeah, uh, actually that would be a good idea. Uh, that's the move. Uh, just to throw a little bit out there, just a little bit of a teaser. So uh, yeah, that's actually a pretty good idea there. Uh, ESG says, well, at least Kurt says stay in the lane. Just ignore my question about blue skies. I actually missed that part. Um, let me go up here. Sky is always blue when you have knowledge. Yeah, over my head. <laughs> like I said, it <laughs> doesn't take much to fly over my head here, so. The sky's always uh, sunny when Steve's on stream. That's my thing. Again. He sun runs. That's oh, my joke. Oh, he sun runs? Oh, that's not a joke. That's just how it is. <laughs> yeah, for 
Yeah. All right. Cool. Uh, so if there's nothing else, we can uh, we can cut this one off. Uh, this will be posted here for anybody who either came in mid session or a little bit late. So we'll have this posted as well as the um, uh, how I study video that I recorded yesterday. So definitely look out for those. They should both be on the Discord uh, a little bit later today. So yeah, we'll cut it off for here. Uh, the plan is, I believe, on Thursday it will be twelve o'clock, but there's a chance we could switch it to one o'clock if I end up uh, having to play tennis on Thursday. So I'll be sure to give you guys a heads up at least one day in advance, and it will also be posted in our schedule as well. So um, yeah, we'll make you guys privy to that for sure. So uh, yeah, just want to say thanks to everybody who joined. Appreciate the feedback. Hope you guys are digging these sessions. I'm having a lot of fun doing these here too. Uh, if you guys have any other questions of the session that we did. Again, please feel free to uh, discuss anything we talked about here in the hand discussion section, and I'll be sure to answer whatever questions you guys have. So, yeah, thanks again. I will catch you guys hopefully on Thursday, and have a good day, guys. Have a good day, Kurt. Take care. All right, later, Slammed. Later, Kenny. Appreciate it, guys. Hey, thank you. Thanks, Slammed. Have a good day, Slammer. Take care.